And after that, I said, it was a Sunday, and there was a Sunday evening church somewhere, and I said, get into the vehicle. I took the child to church where the father had gone. When the father saw the child in the church, he thought that the child had died, that it was a ghost that he saw, because the child was about dying before he left. And now to see all this happening, it was something, a wonderful sight to them. The point is this. Many times people are not able to hear because the devil is bringing a lot of things in the family. That's why the, Jesus himself said, the birds of the air come and they snatch away everything and the people cannot understand. It may be that there is lack of time to meditate and to pray after learning. There are people that preach and preach and preach. There's no time to meditate. There's no time to pray after the meeting. Or it may be that they are hardened by false doctrine. And the people say, I don't want to fight against false doctrine. All I want to preach is preach the gospel. You can preach the gospel all you want. The heart of the, the soil of the heart has been hardened by false doctrine. Oh, they say, I don't want to go against the Jehovah's Witnesses. I don't want to go against all these calls. I don't want to go against all these other people. If you do not break the fallow ground, you'll be sowing on hardened soil. And if you're sowing on hardened soil, you'll never get anything done. Or it may be that they are hardened by culture or the sociology of that community. You must break all these things. What's the solution? What's the remedy? Let's look at Osea chapter 10, verse 12. You have all these people that have all these problems and the heart is hardened. Here is solution for us. Hosea chapter 10 verse 12. Sow to yourselves in righteousness and reap in mercy. Break up your fallow ground. For it is time to seek the Lord till he come and rain righteousness upon you. Break up the fallow ground. Make sure that you deal with the things that have hardened the soil or the heart of the, pe of the people. When you deal with the problem, then they will be able to come to the Lord. I'm going to give you some difficult questions to think about. Difficult because there are people that have a one-way track in thinking. They never think there is a better way they never think there is an alternative. They have a one-way track. But think about the question yourself. Why is it there is so much preaching over the radio? And the people that are preaching over the radio do not have the fruit, the harvest that will match the sacrifice and the money that is put into the radio ministry. Why? Well, a lot of the people that are hearing are already hardened. A lot of the people that are hearing are deafened, are blindfolded by the spirit of this age. And the people that are having these ministries over the radio, they never think about the thing that is affecting the minds of the people. They never think about how to break up their fallow ground. They are laboring. They're doing a lot over the radio. But the fruit that is coming out shows that a lot of the people that are hearing are the side of the way hearers. Another question I have for you to think about. Why is it that television preaching doesn't bring as much fruit as we expect? You know why? Number one, the people that are watching that television, it's not only that program they are watching. They are watching other kinds of programs. You know what the Bible says? It says, the deceitfulness of riches choke the word. It says, the thorns will choke the word. And if you know anything about the television, there are a lot of things going on in the television that will make the people to think about the world, to love the world, to go along with the world. And when you now bring in your seed that you are sowing, there is something that is coming out of that same uh, instrumentality, out of that same television, that is affecting what you are preaching. Another thing you will realize is that 
even in the television preaching itself, apart from all the other programs on the television, the program of the, of the message, they say, you know, if you are going to preach over the television, you cannot preach like we do now. That you cannot go to the Bible and quote the passage and make interpretation. That that will not go with the television audience. They say if you are going to get the television audience, you will have to bring some entertainment. And that's exactly the thing that ruins the siege. Because to see that entertainment we bring does not match the seed we're going to sow eventually. And a lot of the things we bring into that program will not really help the people to be able to get the message that we're going to bring across eventually. Why are we spending so much on all these areas of evangelism and yet not much fruit comes out of it? Again, have a question for you. Why is it when we have a crusade? Then we invite a particular uh, maybe drama group or we invite a good uh, musical group and we have to pay them a lot. Some of these people cannot give their services of music free of charge. You pay them a lot and by the time you bring them to open the meeting for you, they open the meeting quite all right. But then their music appeals to the flesh. Their music appeals to the emotion. Their music appeals to the sensitivities of the body. Their music will not appeal to the soul, to the spirit. And the people will say, if you are going to catch the people of the world, you have to tailor your music and tailor your program to like the world. If you don't do that, you will never get them. My friend, if you do that, you will never get them. It may appear that they are coming, and eventually a lot of those musicians, you can't tell them to play their music only for 30 minutes. No, that's too, that's too small for them. You can't tell them 15 minutes, they'll go on for about one hour. They are the real center of attraction. And when you come in, the people, oh, they are unhappy that they, the people, they appreciate their fans. You have uh, told them to go, and now you come in. What are you going to say? What you are saying is not as interesting as the music. Therefore, the music is going to distract them from the word of God. But you know, as you look at the New Testament, in Acts, don't open, I'll just read it, I'll just tell you. In Acts chapter 2, there was no musical band. That's shocking. In Acts chapter 3 and Acts chapter 4, there was no musical band. In Acts chapter 5, no musical band. In Acts chapter 6, when the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great number of the priests were obedient to the faith, no musical band. Some people say, they can't preach without music. I can they say, they can't do anything without music. Thank God I can. Those who are in Ivory Coast, uh, they will, you know, they will remember. Because we had some of our people from uh, Burkina Faso, from Mali, from Niger Republic, from Senegal. We had them from all over French-speaking uh, 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 places. And that night, and um, I, I know some music myself, and I love music uh, very seriously. But I do not allow the music to disturb my ministry. Then they said uh, a particular group was coming to sing. And, uh, you know, they, come on, they came on the stage. I don't want to mention the country. They were not from Ivory Coast. They were from, you know, a particular country. Uh, they came to attend uh, the program we had in Ivory Coast. And they said they have wonderful, beautiful song. And uh, they, they started uh, singing. It was, it was terrible. It was pathetic. And even the journalists that were there and the video people that were there, they dropped their equipment. The music was bad. The singing was bad. Those who were there that night, and, uh, but I remember that when Charles G. Finney went to a particular place to preach, and he was a lawyer before the Lord called him. When he started, uh, when he started the meeting there, the people were singing. He had to put his finger inside his ears. The, the music, the singing was very bad. And yet God broke out in great power in that place. And that night in Ivory Coast, after the people sang, I felt ashamed of the singing because of the video people. The video people and the media people will not know that those people that uh, they didn't have a permission before they just, you know, pushed themselves there to sing. But then 
I came on there. I didn't, have, I didn't uh, talk about their singing. I just went on to the word of God. And it was the day that we had the greatest outbreak of the power of God. Music was bad. The people were disappointed about the music. I myself was embarrassed about the music, but it was the greatest day. It was a climax of that uh, crusade. Not the last day, but it was literally the climax of that thing. You know, it's very important. We do not depend on this, this, or that. Depend upon the Spirit of God. Now, I've spent some time on the first kind of soil. Do I have time to go to the second? Are you tired? Now the second, the stony, the rocky hearts. Let go, let's go back to Matthew chapter 13. Verses 5 and 6. Some fell upon stony places where they had not much earth, and forthwith they sprung up because they had no deepness of earth. And when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. In verse 20, but he that received the seed in stony places is the same that heareth the word, and anon with joy receiveth it, with joy, with excitement, yet a see not root in himself, but dureth for a while. For when tribulation and persecution ariseth because of the word, by and by, is offended what are the characteristics of this group of people one they have superficial response to superficial preaching superficial response to superficial preaching what i discover in the christian fold now all over the world. Doesn't matter anywhere you go. Except among the evangelicals. I, I respect the evangelicals. And I'm sorry to say that even though I'm Pentecostal, I do not respect the Pentecostals as much as I respect the evangelicals. The reason is this. The Pentecostals are too superficial. No theologians among them. Real, serious, weighty theologians of note. We're too superficial, dancing, singing, raising hand, moving this way, moving that way. We do not, evangelicals are serious about quiet time. Real evangelicals, you'll find among even young people in the scripture union, once they become born again, every morning they read their Bible. Uh, they want to really go into the word of God They will say, if you want to grow Read your Bible and pray every day Read your Bible Pray every day Pray every day Pray every day Read your Bible Pray every day If you want to grow Then you keep on singing but they don't only sing it, they do it. Pentecostal people, on the other hand, you no. Know, once we speak in tongues, we raise up our hands, and we do everything that we used to do, that's all. But the deep, serious teaching of the word of God is missing. And you find that even though we have a lot of people that will say they are charismatics and they are Pentecostals, they are not deep. They are not people that can dig deep into the word of God and the form of service you will see it in the form of service you go to a real evangelical church that has a good standing they will give enough place to the preaching of the word of God but among uh, our friends and you know we're we are Pentecostals because we believe in the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in tongues and we believe in all these gifts of the spirit but you know what we find out there's a lot of superficiality and you find that they are not able to go deep into the word of God and preach the word in season and out of season to rebuke. Pentecostals don't rebuke anymore. You know, they only motivate. They only maybe make you get excited. Or they only make you just raise up your hand and get this done and get this done. When persecution arises, those people cannot stand. They do not have backbone to their conviction. They cannot stand on the authority of the word of God and say like Martin Luther, here is where I stand. 
even if there are as many devils as the tiles on this floor, I'm not going to change God being my helper. You see, if we're going to really see evangelism or evangelization, if we're going to really see church growing, all these superficial things, we need to cut them all. You know, many people, when they are preaching, they like you to clap. I, I don't appreciate that. Because when the people are excited, they never take notes. They never write anything down. They are only happy and they jump up. And after the meeting, you know, we may, you know, rise up and pray and speak in tongues and do a lot of things. Immediately they get back, you find adultery and fornication among Pentecostals more than among the evangelicals. You find the things of the flesh among Pentecostals more than among evangelicals. And if we are not very serious with the teaching of the word of God in our churches, who is going to do the evangelism? When our members are not strong, when our members, a little difficulty, they backslide. But thank God that you can have a different ministry. Just a few weeks ago, a few months ago, I was talking to a, a, a girl, right now a lady. But when she came to the Lord, she was just at that time a school girl. She was in secondary two, I think, at that time. And we had a program. We got these young people together. And in our young people's programs, we teach them the word of God. In that place, they showed them the uh, theme of the born in hell. Oh, she cried almost her heart out. And she gave her lives completely unto the Lord. And a change came immediately. She got back home. She said, Mommy, I'm now a Christian. I'm born again. I'm a child of God. And they had been of another religion before. And, uh, you know, she said, I'm sorry, I cannot sit down and be, you know, praying five times a day anymore and washing my mouth and washing hand and washing this. I'm, I'm not in that anymore. Now I'm going with Jesus. The mother said, not in this house. And then said, you wait for your senior brother. And uh, when the senior brother came, the mother reported and said, you know what your junior sister has done? She's gone to take uh, not even the normal branch of Christianity. It's gone to take the deep or the deeper kind of Christianity. And see what you will do. And the man was mad. And the man came out and said, what did mommy say? And the, lady, the girl at that time, secondary two, young, young girl, said, what mommy was telling you is that I met Jesus Christ in an experiential encounter. And the man, that thing complicated the whole matter. And uh, so the man went in and brought out cordials, real, you know, a kind of whip you use on animal. And uh, started beating that girl. Oh, yes, the child cried. It was painful. After the crying and after the beating, the brother, the senior brother said, uh, how about it now? You must leave the scene. And the girl looked at him and said, my brother, you don't understand. You can beat me to death. I am for Jesus. And said not only that, my brother, if God is real, if the experience of God is real, two weeks, you'll get the same experience. And the man started beating the girl again. Just just beat her. She bled. It was terrible. And after that, the man said again, give up this sin or I don't care if you die. And the girl said, you cannot beat Jesus out of me. But what I know is that only two weeks I give you. If what I've got is real, two weeks. And I was talking to a very serious, fanatical person in that other religion. And he said, I give you two weeks, my brothers and sisters. Two weeks did not run out. Nobody preached to the man. Terrible conviction came upon the man. He couldn't rest. In the night, he was just remembering, I'm a sinner, I'm a sinner, I'm a sinner. In the day, I'm a sinner. In the night, I'm a sinner. And then went to the girl and said, that thing you got, how did you say you got it? And the girl led her senior brother to the Lord Jesus Christ. Both of them are now members of the church. Preach the word. Preach the word. Preach the word. 
be instant in season and out of season. Rebuke, reprove with all authority that the people may be sound in doctrine for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their itching ears, they will heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. But you, do the work of an evangelist. Make full proof of thy ministry. For I'm ready to be offered for the faith that I've been preaching. But then Paul the apostle said, that doesn't matter at all. I have fought a good fight. You fight a good fight. Preach the gospel. Not, you know, we're not entertaining people. A preacher is not an entertainer. It's not a clown. It's not a, a fun fair fellow. It's not a person that wants people to laugh. Some people, when they are preaching, all they want is that people will laugh, people will clap, people will rejoice. Why should sinners rejoice? If the message is true, if the message is biblical, it will make the sinner feel uncomfortable and if your message is not making sinners feel uncomfortable there is something that is missing in that message you see why some of these people are not sound and why they do not give their lives to the lord is that they do not allow the word to sink in the preoccupations hinder the real preaching of the word and there is no warning and there is no preparation for persecution they talk about prosperity and so when the people do not have any job, they backslide. They say, well, this is not the gospel they preach to us. They say that if we come to the Lord, the Lord will butter our bread, it will sugar our tea, it will provide everything that we need. We never tell them that there was a man called Lazarus who was brought to the gate of the man who was rich. And that Lazarus was full of sauce. We tell them, Christians can never have any problem. We say, who has problem? Devil. Who has problem? Satan. Who has problem? Demons. Are you a child of God? Yes, I'm a child of God. Can you ever get any problem? No. But the Bible says, he that will live godly shall suffer persecution. We never tell them. We never prepare their mind. And when the persecution eventually comes, the people are not able to stand. You see, if you are preaching the goody, goody gospel, if you are preaching the sweet, sweet gospel, if you are not telling the people, will have affliction. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth them out of them all. Tell me, brothers and sisters, didn't Abraham have trouble? Oh, you better believe it. He had a lot of trouble. I have the blessings of Abraham. You may have the problems of Abraham too. Didn't Joseph have problem? Oh, you better believe it. He had a lot of problems. Didn't David, that king, great king, didn't have problems? Oh, he had more than a share. How about Daniel? Oh, yes, he had. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Think about them. How about the Lord Jesus Christ, our forerunner? The author and the finisher of our faith. No problem? Oh, you better believe it, a lot of problems. And the disciples that saw him face to face. The disciples that walked upon the sea. The disciples that saw the Mount of Transfiguration. The disciples that experienced Pentecost the first time. Before we came to experience Pentecost. Did they have persecution? You better believe it, they had persecution. Paul the Apostle and Silas and all those people that preach the gospel the apostle to the gentiles did they have any persecution oh yes they had persecution the bible has not promised us a bed of roses think you that have bought peace on the earth no i have not bought peace but division because now there will be five in the family two divided against three because the father will cast the son into prison and even the daughter will go against the mother the mother and the daughter-in-law against the mother-in-law and it says he that endures to the end there's something to endure jesus said when he looked at the people that were following him he said take up your cross and follow me but today we do not tell the people there's a cross to bear and when a cross comes they're disappointed they're not they're unhappy Oh, they say, this is not what I thought Christianity would look like. But thank God, if we tell them the whole truth and tell them persecution may come, opposition may come, 
But the word of God stands firm. You know, let me tell you something. This whole year, from January till this very time, March, in Lagos here, in our church in town, and in the church here, I've only prayed for the sick once. On Thursday, we have a miracle revival hour. This year, I just decided I wanted to see how outstanding, how firm this congregation is. I wanted to see whether it's an abiding fruit. I wanted to see whether they're only coming because of the great and mighty things that the Lord is doing. Whether they're only coming because of bread and butter. And, you know, I just went into real holiness teaching and revival message. And, and some of the messages, uh, you know, sometimes when I'm preaching them myself, I will know that this is a hard saying. Who can receive it? I, I will know myself, but it's wonderful. This year, the people are rejoicing. They are very happy. And you know, you see them, and uh, you know, I was coming to this church at the Ayobohi IBTC the other time, and uh, they had started crosses because I finished at Bagara before coming here. And while I was coming, the people, they were running. They were running to the place here to come and hear the word of God. And then we finished. And uh, it was a little bit later. You know, this place is very far from the town. And that night, some of them could not see vehicle in time. And I stayed counseling here. And, uh, you know, when I finished the counseling, I was going. I saw some of them, they were walking beyond Ipaja. Some of them walked from here to the new road. And then, the next uh, week, the attendance, I thought that <laughs> these people, they will say, I don't think I'll be able to make this thing again. The attendance went up the following week. That gives you joy. You know, this is solid work. You know, you are doing something that the Lord himself has approved. Not just bread and butter. Not just entertainment. Not just, you know, uh, we're giving them this, we're giving them that. Because of our time, let's go on. And what's the solution to this stony ground? Well, the Bible says, it's not my word like hammer that breaks the rock in pieces. That's the solution. If the people have rocky hearts, bring in the hammer of the word of God and smash all the rocky hearts. And then by prayer, because God says, I will remove the stony heart out of their flesh and I will give them a heart of flesh. Number three, on thorny ground. In Matthew chapter 13, verse 7. Matthew 13, verse 7. And some fell among the thorns. And the thorns sprung up and choked them. In verse 22, the interpretation of Jesus Christ himself, he also who, that received the seed among thorns is he that heareth the word and the care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becometh unfruitful. Here the Lord is saying that if the church is worldly, the church will never bear fruit. You know, there are people that will say, well, we're not going to go against dancing and drinking and television and worldliness and all these things because let people do what they like. All we want to tell them is let them come and hear the word of God. The worldliness will be like thorns that will choke the word. They'll be running from ordinary television to colored television. They'll be chasing all the programs on television all about. And they'll be going from marriage ceremony to naming ceremony. They'll be, their lives will be filled, saturated with all the things of this world. And uh, if you want them to evangelize, you can't find them. They have run after politics. You want them to do something significant in the kingdom of God in building the work of the Lord. You can't find them. They have gone for another ceremony. But Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah, when they were marrying and giving in marriage, eating and drinking, so shall it be at the time of the coming of the Son of Man. The flood came upon them unawares. They didn't know when the flood came. And so when the Son of Man shall come, they shall be eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the flood will come, the trumpet will sound, the saints will go, and the people will still be here. It's unfortunate. Some pastors as the masters of ceremony in every marriage in, in the state. 
and they keep jumping about. Oh, they say, you know, I'm so popular with the young people. Anytime they want to get married, they call me to come and do what? To come and eat and drink. Their blood will be upon you. Because the worldliness you are supporting, it's not that they shouldn't marry. But let everything be done in moderation. We find all these, you know, Christian people, they want to get married. They go to get all these musicians that are beating drums and playing trumpets in the world, in the night club. They come to tell the, you know, these musicians, they say, we Christian people, we are having a great, great thing. And then, when, as you find the music and the noise and the pageantry and the worldliness and everything they are doing there, except you are hearing the name of Jesus once in a while, in the beating of the drum and in the dancing, you wouldn't know it's a Christian occasion. And some people will say, you know, we do that for our people because if we don't allow them to do it in the church, they may leave the church and go and be looking for it in the world. So that they don't do it in the world, that's why we make it available for them in the church. They'll never bring any fruit to perfection. The thorn, the worldliness will choke the world. And if in your church, you allow the people, now in, you know, in our church over here, if, uh, you know, I call a particular zona leader at a time, or maybe a Christian worker, just a member of the church, and he happens uh, not to be around, and then when he comes back, and you know I never forget as a part, I write it down. And it may be one month later that, you know, the fellow comes back, I ask him, we, we wanted your attention, we couldn't see you. And uh, what, my, what happened to you? If he told me that, well, somebody was having a marriage ceremony at, uh, you know, Kaduna up north, he went to attend. I was asking whether there are not enough people there to attend marriage. That you have to leave Lagos. If you have accident, by the way, on which account are you going to put that? Is that on the account of evangelism or mission that you are going to put that? And you see, if we just allow everything to go on in our church, you know, thousands of people. And uh, thank God they are all having children. And some of the times, by prayer, some of them, 29 years, they are married, there's no child. We pray for them, they have child. Some of them, 20 years, 23 years, we have a lot of them in Lagos. Yeah? They said they've never got any child. And doctors said they'll never be able to get any child. Just, you know, say in the name of Jesus, uh, woman, that thing is broken. Go ahead. You, next year, this time, you'll have your child. And, you know, the Lord honors his word. And uh, honors his anointed. And the work is done. But when that happens, we don't allow them, you know, create time in the church service for 30 minutes. And say, so you see, this woman has been looking for child for, uh, you know, 25 years, for 23 years. Now she's got a child. How many of, uh, you know, the young women association that are rejoicing with her, then they all come out and they dance around and they take the child. After they have gone, then the old women association, and then they come out and they dance because, uh, you know, we're having naming ceremony. And then we say, well, it's not only women that can rejoice when children are born. Men also can rejoice. And you men get up, you know, we come and dance, and then 30 minutes have gone because of a child. We don't know whether that child is going to be brought up in the way of the gospel. We don't know whether that child is going to become a Judas or a John. And today, you know, we spend all the time instead of putting the word in their hand and telling them, now you have a child, here is your responsibility. Train up a child in the way he should go. When he's old, he will not depart from it. But worldliness has eaten up a lot of churches. You see, if the worldliness is there, the people will not be able to stand eventually. And the same thing when marriages are being done. You know, in Lagos, uh, if, uh, you know, the Lagos church is so large, sometimes we have about 12 marriages in one day. Because, uh, you know, if you wait for just once every Saturday, you will never get some people married. And so whenever we're having marriage in Lagos, we just get about 12 people together, make the announcement, and then after that, all the 12 will come. And it never disturbs our work at Saturday workers' meeting. Uh, recently, uh, one of our organists, we have a number of them in Lagos there, uh, he got married and uh, on a Saturday. And when he got married on a Saturday, 
that Sunday he was to play in church. I, I don't, I won't accept if he says, uh, you know, sir, that I just got married, I'm going to do honeymoon. I said, oh, we'll play the organ. You are going to do your honeymoon. The best honeymoon is when you are serving the Lord. The best honeymoon is when you give your life. Let your wife know. The wife you have just got married to, let him know that your life is dedicated to the gospel. Many years ago, Spurgeon, C.H. Spurgeon, was in courtship with the lady that he eventually got married to. And he had been a preacher of the gospel in Britain. And this time, there was a crowd waiting for Spurgeon. And as he was going, he was going with the uh, person, the fiancé. And because of the crowd, uh, this man, Spurgeon, forgot about the woman, about the lady. And just went to the platform. Because of the crowd, they just, you know, tried to get through. And then he went to preach. And the woman could not struggle through the crowd like Spurgeon. And eventually the woman felt hurt, felt embarrassed, felt unhappy that, you know, you know, this is the man I want to marry. And he let me, I went to preach and then went home without even waiting for the meeting, unhappy. Spurgeon finished preaching, made the altar call. People responded, they came to the Lord. Then Spurgeon was looking for the fiancé so that, you know, they can go back home together. And the woman could not be found. What was the matter? And then uh, went to the house and saw that the woman has gone to her house. And Spurgeon said, why? Why didn't you wait for me? And the woman said, you know, she got angry. She felt offended. That hey, you left me there. You went to the crowd. Oh, Spurgeon said, let's straighten the matter immediately. Sit down. I'm called, number one, to be a preacher before a husband. We are not married yet. If this is how you will continue to behave and to react against my commitment to the preaching of the gospel, let's break it. Let's part now, now. The woman said, I didn't know it is so serious and said, I'm sorry. <laughs> and the woman consecrated herself and by the grace of God, they were able to do the work together. You see, a lot of these things disturb people. And they act like thorns. But what are you going to do? Well, what to do is to make sure that you don't allow these things to hinder, charge the people that are rich in this world not to be high-minded, not to trust in the uncertainty of riches. Let us warn the people because godliness with contentment is great gain. We brought nothing into this world. There are a lot of members in the church now that they will take three jobs together. Nobody to do evangelism. Nobody to work for the Lord. And uh, you will find that, you know, they are on business here. They are on business over there. If they are going to serve the Lord, the deceitfulness of riches must not carry them away. We tell them in our own church here. We tell them, number one thing that God needs is not your money. If you are not doing evangelism and you are not placing your life upon the altar, go away with your money. Money is not going to preach the gospel. Before we had this uh, meeting over here, we, I, I spoke to the workers, to the people on Saturday, last Saturday. I said, we're having ministers' conference. And I said, we're going to clean up the IBTC and that we're going to do it for the Lord. The ministers of the gospel are coming from Deeper Life and from other churches. Therefore, any of you that really wants, uh, you know, to serve the Lord, where are you? Raise up your hand because we're going to clean up the IBTC. I said, not only that. I said, look up here. We do not have enough mattresses. And you have the mattresses. If you don't have, go and buy one. We need mattresses for those ministers when they come. And you, at your own expense, will go for the mattresses. And then you will bring them. The church is not, was not even ready to give them money to transport the mattresses to come over here. I don't know how they got the mattresses. Some of them who didn't have, they went to buy new ones. Some of them that had and they had not started using them, they brought them. And some of them that had others, they cleaned them up and they chartered vehicles on their own, you know, in the zones, and they brought them over here. I wasn't here. I was preparing my messages. I, I didn't have to stay here with them because worldliness had not eaten them in their hearts. And, uh, you know, Monday they were all here. And you know, they scrubbed the floor, they did this, they did a lot of things. On Tuesday, they were here again. On Wednesday, some of them were still here. And um, when I called the coordinators together in Lagos, 
And uh, I said, uh, we'll need people to supervise those who are going to work at the IBTC. Now, how do you think I did it? Did you think I said, uh, how, which of you will get chance? No, not me. Uh, I, don't, I don't lead like that. I looked at one I said, uh, and some of them, I think they are here tonight. I said, brother, uh, if we are to vote, everybody will vote for you. So the vote has caught you. You supervise the work at the IBTC. He smiled and said, yes, sir. I said, uh, brother, I know you are free. You are self-employed. You leave your work Monday and Tuesday. Please supervise the work there. I said, brother, I said, uh, I'm sure you'll be there. Am I not right? Then, you know, that's how we settled it. Within about five minutes, we got all the people that will supervise them. And once they were here, I didn't come here to, you know, to look at the thing. I knew that the thing will be done. I was staying at home preparing for the messages I'll be preaching here. If the hearts of the people had been totally uh, squeezed and choked with the deceitfulness of riches, you cannot do that. You will not get the people when you need them. If you preach, if you say, let us do it, they will not do it. What are you going to do? Let us build a kind of work that will last. Now, number four. Are you still with me? The good ground. The good ground is good, touched by the grace of God. Productive, having the spirit of God, and fruitful. Bringing forth thirtyfold. 60 fold, 100 fold of the same kind. I wish we had enough time to be able to look at this fruit bearing of this kind of soil. But let me throw out this to you. And state overseers of deeper life, please let me talk to you. What if each state overseer here will produce? at least 30 state or national overseer as effective as himself. That's 30-fold. What Jesus referred to as 30-fold is that you drop the corn into the ground and the corn through a process of dying and germinating will bring forth and it will reproduce not something inferior to the original seed, but something of equal reproductive ability to the original seed. What it means, therefore, is this, that we have planted the seed. And the person planting the seed is a child of God, is a preacher of the gospel. One, the word of God has effect in the hearts of the people that we're preaching to. The people are born again. But that seed now, even though yet it has bought for fruit, it's still not like you. Because you are not just an ordinary member of the church. You are a preacher. You are bearing 30-fold fruit. When you so disciple, you so train, you so equip, you so mobilize, all these 30 people that they can say, by the grace of God, this state overseer has produced 30 strong, militant, spirit-filled people who can handle the work in exactly the same way like he is handling the work. That's the, that's, the, that's the aim or the goal or the desire of Jesus Christ himself. He that believes in me, the works that I do, he shall do also. And greater works than this shall he do because I go to the Father. He wanted to reproduce himself in them. And therefore the challenge is this. For every state overseer, we need missionaries that will go to the various countries. We need people that will take the gospel out. And state overseers, let me talk directly to you. By the grace of God, a lot of you are here in Lagos. And you know, it gives me joy, real joy in my heart. When some of our Lagos people, they go to worship outside, maybe they have work outside or they have something, and they attend deeper life in the state capital. And then I ask some of them when I have opportunity of talking to them, and they said, we are surprised. I said, what surprised you? They said, we, when we were hearing the preaching over the uh, loudspeaker, 
when we entered into the church at the state capital in such and such a place, it was just like Lagos here. And then when we sat down, the choir, now look at the choir here that came to sing. This is not Lagos choir. This is choir from a state capital. The people that came yesterday, that's choir from another state capital. And then tomorrow we'll have another from another state capital. And then the ushers we have here, as things are orderly, they are ushers from the states. The security we have here, the security from the states. The people that are cooking in the kitchen, they are people from the state. I think I can say, by the grace of God, I can say I've not been fruitless. I've not been barren. Apart from just having a large church over here, by the grace of God, there are people that have listened to, by the grace of God, my message, and they have been developed. And by the process of crucifixion, by the process of planting that corn, by the process of dying, by the process of humility and meekness and doing the work of the Lord, I can say I've been, I've been reproduced, Excuse my language, don't mind, because Paul the Apostle said, If I be not a father unto the others, am I not a father unto you? Because by the gospel I have begotten you by the preaching of the word. And then after he said that, he said, Follow me as I follow Christ. And these people, by the grace of God, we can say they are handling something. The challenge I'm not throwing to them is this. As they have been reproduced, and by the grace of God, we can say all over Africa, you know, we have people in, you know, uh, Republic of Benin, we have in Ghana, we have in Sierra Leone, we have almost all the countries of Africa. And anytime we get over there, sometimes I just enjoy to sit down. It's instead of preaching, I just want to listen to the people that are over there so I can see whether my ministry over here in Nigeria, before they left for Benin Republic, before they left for Ghana, before they left for Kenya, before they left for all these various countries, whether the thing are born fruit in their heart. And I can tell you by the grace of God, it's bearing fruit. In London, we have three, I think they, maybe they have gone to four services now in London. And the person that is pastoring the church there was sent from Lagos here. We are bearing fruit. And this is what the Lord is expecting. It's now your turn. Sit over seers. You go and bear fruit to you. You develop people that by the grace of God, you will say, and you know, you don't have to stop at 30 fold. Why not have about 60 effective pastors like yourself and bear 60 fold? Why don't you have 100 effective pastors like yourself that some of you are pastoring 7,000 membership church, 6,000, 5,000, 2,000. Why don't you develop people like yourself that you'll say you are bearing fruit 30 fold, 60 fold, or 100 fold? Now let me talk to the pastors. You are a pastor, you have a ministry. That's wonderful. The evidence that you are bearing fruit is that you say, Now I'm a pastor. Can I reproduce myself in other people? Can I so preach the gospel, disciple the people that are coming to the church, that as I am a pastor, I will bear fruit thirtyfold. My brothers and sisters, if you bear a kind of fruit like that, if Jesus tarries and you have to go home, the work will continue. But if all that you have is just a crowd, a crowd like crusade crowd, when you are there, they are there. But you do not have people that can do it like you are doing it. You do not have people that can plan like you can plan. You do not have people that can cast out devils like you can cast out devils. You do not have people that are burden for evangelism, burden for the evangelization of Nigeria and of Africa like you are burden. You are the only one that is able to do it. You are not able to reproduce yourself as a pastor in other people. You are not bringing forth even tenfold or twentyfold or thirtyfold, not to talk of hundredfold. If Jesus tarries and you are gone, what will happen? to your ministry. Let me remind you. In the uh, you know, years that have gone by, Catherine Coleman was a great, great, great healing minister. A woman, but great. Mighty, powerful in praying for the sick. And the testimonies in our meetings, if you have read the book, God can do it again. If you have read the book, I Believe in Miracles. That's uh, the book that talks about testimonies of her ministry, her ministry of healing. But after she died, 
where is that ministry now? You see, bearing fruit is not just gathering crowd. It is sitting down and saying, whatever ego is in me, that people are not willing to follow after my example, they're not willing to learn from me, whatever ego is in me, that I'm not able to be reproduced in these people to do a militant work, an effective work, let that thing be crucified, let the corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, so it can bring forth a lot of fruit. I can tell you about a lot of people. And you know, all these people, I love them. I appreciate them, really. I love them, I appreciate them. But the point I'm making is this. Where is the abiding fruit? Where are the people they are raising up? Where are the people that can take over from them? Where are the people that they will be able to say, by the grace of God, I have 30 other people they can preach like I do. You know, this morning, you were here, I was here. I listened to that brother preaching, uh, you know, from Lagos here. And uh, when I listened to him, as he talked about Christ in you, life and ministry, I looked up to God and I said, God, I thank you. And he even said some things that I jotted down that I needed to pray about. And I said, God, I thank you. If I can have people like this, and I can make them not only that they can preach, they are willing to go out and do anything. Then, Lord, then my, my work can then be limited to training other people, reproducing myself in people, and he can go to that other area. You were here that yesterday morning, and, uh, you know, we had another person that spoke from Lagos here. And when he spoke, although I was not physically here, but I was, you know, there, and all the point one, point two, point three, I said, oh, Lord, I thank you. That's reproduction. That these people can preach like this, they can lay line upon line, precept upon precept, and they can do something like this. You were here in the afternoon when I had to call the choir back, and you know, that solo is to come and sing. I'm on the battlefield for the Lord. Now, let me tell you, many years ago, that was one song that made me to be willing that, Lord, whether death or life, I will preach the gospel. And I sang that song every morning. I'll wake up in the morning in the bathroom. I will sing it. I will sing and cry. I will sing and dedicate myself. I will sing and lay myself upon the altar and say, Lord, I'm on the battlefield for the Lord. You know, I saw a lot of persecution, a lot of opposition, a lot of misunderstanding. I will remember that song. I will sing it again. But because I've been, you know, preaching and preaching along the line, I didn't remember that song. And when that sister sang it this morning, it touched the chord of my heart again. I remember the consecration. The thing I laid upon the altar, those days came back to my mind. And I said, God, I thank you that I know I'm not old yet, but if I were to, you know, go and be with the Lord, thank God that these people, will, they, they sing the same songs, they say the same thing, they preach the same thing, they do it the same way. And uh, if I were just to sit down and just enjoy, just enjoy the, the music and the preaching and everything they are doing, that's fruit bearing. That's my appeal to you. Don't do it alone. Find time to reproduce yourself in people. And bear fruit 30 fold, 60 fold, 100 fold. What if, as we're here tonight, you as a pastor, you will say, I will be the good ground, I'll be the good soil, I'll be the good heart, and as I receive the word, I will not only benefit from the word, but Lord, I promise you, I will raise up. By the help of the Lord, by the grace of the Lord, by the anointing of the Spirit of God, by fire from above, whatever consecration it will take me. Oh Lord, at least 30 other people, I will give 30 preachers to the world. Oh Lord, I consecrate myself, I will give 60 other preachers to the Lord. Oh Lord, you have given me a chance, an opportunity. I planted a church of 500, of 1,000, of 5,000, of 7,000, of 10,000. I will give 100 preachers to the work of the Lord that will be able to do something like that. 
that's fruit bearing that's fruit bearing that some received the seed in the good ground and they bore fruit they were fruitful and they brought forth 30 fold and 60 fold and a hundred fold but if that is going to happen the corn of wheat must fall into the ground and die not only that, Jesus said, I am, the, I am the vine, and ye are the branches. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, my Father cuts away. Every branch that bears fruit, he purges, he cleanses, and he cuts some branches, he cuts some things up. All the things that are not, that are not going to allow you to bear fruit, he cuts everything up, he chastises, he lays his mighty hand upon you, so that you can bear more fruit. And if you are going to bear this kind of fruit I'm talking about, you will have to do it like Paul the Apostle that will say, because you are precious in our sight, you are dear unto us. We did not only impart the gospel unto you, we imparted our very soul unto you. The state of overseers will, bring me, uh, will bear me out. I impart myself unto them. I tell them stories of my life. I tell them how things are done. I tell them everything. Ev literally everything. Everything. And by the grace of God, they are able to handle the work with wisdom. They are able to handle things and they have the same conse uh, consecration. We are having a meeting uh, in the afternoon. And, uh, you know, the PFN and uh, some representatives came and they were pleading with us that, you know, they knew that they offended us and what they did in the past was, you know, not actually right. And they uh, called the state overseers there, you know, when you can depend upon people. And I, I can hand over things to them. And I called them there and I said, now, you know, this is the problem. Talk and look into it. You know, one of them rose up and said, now, we're not that we're not willing to cooperate with you people, but we want to see some seriousness. Because if we are going to do anything, the way he put it, he said, it's either that we do it successfully or die there. That's what caught me. I said as a soldier, a soldier of the cross. You know, when you bring up people, when you raise up people and they tell you and they tell everybody while you are there that the work God has given them to do, they do not mind, they can die at their post. You know, like uh, Simeon, you can say, oh Lord, now let thy servant go in peace because I've seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. When you see all these people that have been raised up, you see the people that are on the firing line, you see the people that say, do or die, we're going to do the work of God. Oh, I tell the Lord, oh Lord, I'm so happy. I'm so fortunate that you have allowed this group of people to be around me and I'm still doing more. I still want to reproduce myself more and more in them. And they too in turn to reproduce themselves in other people. The challenge I give to everybody here tonight is that you will say, I will not be alone. I will not be alone. I'm going to raise up other pastors. I'm going to raise up other ministers. Hundredfold, thirtyfold, and sixtyfold. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer that the Lord will help us to do it. 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 Bearing fruit. Bearing fruit. Break up your fallow ground. Break up your fallow ground. If the heart is hardened, if the heart is hardened, break it off. Break it off. Don't let the seed fall on the hard ground. Don't let it fall on the rocky ground. Don't let it fall on the thorny ground. Make it a good ground. Make it a cultivated ground. Will you reproduce yourself in other people? If you are a pastor, can you raise up 30 other pastors? If you are an overseer, can you reproduce in your denomination 30 other overseers? 
that will do a great job, a good job, a militant job for the Lord. If you're an evangelist, can you raise up 30 other evangelists, 60 other evangelists, 100 other evangelists? Except the corn of wheat falls into the ground and die, it will abide alone. But when it falls into the ground, and pride will die, ego will die, self will will die, and you are willing to bear fruit, willing to bear fruit, then you bring forth fruit into the fold. <laughs> excited today because God has been so faithful to me. I'm going to keep this very short. First of all, I want to thank God for the church. The church has been my family. Um, thank you so much, Pastor Dada. He has been a father to me. I don't start crying. Okay, um, I remember I came here without um, scholarship to Harvard University. The first year wasn't easy, but I got a grant that paid half of my tuition. But then from second year, I got like five different scholarships from my department.